Windsor, would you please stand to your feet with us and worship this morning?
background of all my traditions. But God, I, I ask on for my own heart, and hopefully for hearts extended here in person and joining us online, that God, we do not want to just go through the motions. We don't want to keep you in some kind of box where you can't control everything about us. God, some of us know for sure areas, if we relinquish control, what you would do. And we're scared of that, but God, we can trust you. So help us push past whatever fear we might hold on to and allowing you to control every single part of our lives because you are a good, loving God. And I pray that in my soul, in my life, in my decisions, in my values, not just in this moment, but as I live out my life, God, you get to do whatever it is you want to do. You are worthy of all of our praise and all of our hope. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Those of you here in person, you can take a seat. Thanks for being with us this morning. Those of you online, we'd love to say hi. Say hi in the comment section, however you're joining us. All right, wonderful being with you this morning. Beautiful Colorado day. If you don't know me, I'm John. I'm the campus pastor here at our Timberline Church, Windsor campus. And Timberline exists as one church with different campuses, one church. And we know that there are many great Bible-believing, Jesus-loving churches. And our goal for you is that you would be rooted and connected and known at a local church. We start off with that every weekend because we want to make sure that church is about relationships. Church is about connectivity. So that's why we have that slide right there on the screen. Uh, you can text the word, I'm the words, it's two. I figured that out. Uh, I'm new to that number there on the screen, 970-670-7863. If you text the words, I'm new to that, it's kind of like an electronic connection card, which just lets us know that you're here uh, on the back end. That allows me the opportunity to reach out to you a little bit later on this week, whether by phone or text or email, whatever's best for you, I would love that opportunity to say hi. Those of you here in person, there's also uh, cards, physical cards in the seat backs around you if you're looking for that, for I'm new or any prayer requests or anything we can help you with, any decisions that, that God's stirring in your life. Um, we want to make sure, as we've been talking about throughout all of this series in Ephesians, we want to make sure that we recognize that church, this, our faith, is about more than just what we receive out of it, okay? This is more than just whatever we're getting and whatever needs it meets for us. We're also supposed to be meeting the needs of one another. And so that's why we constantly keep service opportunities in front of us. This is a season where we're listening, connecting, and serving. And so uh, again, those of you here in person, you'll see that there's a Timber Kids flyer or something uh, in the seat backs around you there. We are 10 volunteers short of being able to open up full Timber Kids ministries for both services on Sunday. Right now, we have full Timber Kids ministry six uh, months up through fifth grade at this service, the 830 service. We'd love to extend that also to 10 o'clock. There are people that I know would be blessed by that. We need 10 volunteers to be able to do that on a weekly basis. And so we would love for you to serve in that way. Again, an extension of church being about more than just what we get out of it, serving and connecting. So if you want to do that, take that slip, fill it out. We'll take it from there. We also have monthly what we call NOCO community projects. These happen once a month, uh, the third Saturday of every month. We have an opportunity to bless our neighbors, bless projects identified in the community. And so uh, the March project is now open where we're going to serve at the Loveland Youth Gardener Farm, helping them prepare their farm for this year's garden season. So just stuff like that, tangible ways we can serve and bless our community. How many of us realize that the mark of a healthy church is not just seating capacity, but also sending capacity where we get out and we ensure that our faith is active. And so uh, whether it's Timber Kids or NOCO Community Projects or whatever it looks like, we want to ensure that, that our faith is about more than just what we get out of it. It's about one another, as we're going to hear about today from Pastor Dick Foth, who is with us. He'll be coming up right after this short video. say 
hello, there you are, and it's raw power. <laughs> Wonderful to see you face to face. Here we are in the middle of a series reading somebody else's mail, essentially, a 2,000-year-old letter that has tremendous application to today, the letter from St. Paul to the Ephesians. Paul is an old man. He's not as old as I am, but he's, by his day, he was in his early 60s sitting in a Roman jail, probably around 62 AD. And it's, he gives us in this letter a perspective and experience of a person who had quite a life. And that life within the next couple of years will be gone. So he's writing to friends in what we call now Western Turkey. He had been there eight years before. He had had three big trips in the 10 years prior to that across Turkey. And, uh, and he's a letter writer. 13 of the letters in what we call the New Testament are written by Paul. I have a friend in Washington, D.C. who used to say, Here, here's Paul's MO, his, his method of operation, is that if he came and saw you, then he would try to come back. So he'd go to see that person again or that congregation, or he would send a friend, or he'd send a friend with a letter. That's what this is about. There's a young man here by the name of Tychicus that is probably, he's probably dictating this. Don't know that for sure. But he'll carry that letter, hand carry. He didn't have postal service and postage stamps and all that in the first century. So he'll hand carry this letter. And it's an encyclical letter. That means that people won't read it. They'll hear it. So they take it from place to place and they'll say it. Somebody will read it but it's more of a listening post kind of thing. So this is a letter, Ephesians is a letter about encouragement. Some of Paul's letters are about correction, like get your act together. This one is not one of those. This is just giving a perspective on what Jesus has done in their life, what they're about as a church. The first two chapters, and Pastor Bob Seal and last week Mackenzie Matthews talked about chapters one and two, it was this idea of um, sort of journaling, Paul's journaling who Jesus is to them, what he's been, king of the universe, the, the center of their lives and all of this, what he's done. And when I read those chapters, you forgive me, when I read those chapters, I feel like a little kid again. It's been a long time since I was a little kid, okay? And... Um, it's me doing my favorite thing. That's what I have in my mind, which was riding a train. Do I have any train riders here? Any, anybody who likes trains? Yeah. And there's something about that. Well, I, I was born in Oakland, California, a port city, not unlike Saul of Tarsus, Paul. Paul was born in, a, in Tarsus, which was a port city. So that's my main connection to him, okay? But I was born there almost 79 years ago. And when I was three and a half years old, not in Tarsus, in Oakland, California, and, and when I was three and a half years old, my parents, at the end of World War II, 1945, went as missionaries to India. So we got on a train in Oakland in the spring, went all the way to New York City, then got on a big ship, went across the ocean to India, then got on a train and went to where we were going to live. And then school time came a few months later, and I started school when I was four with my sister. And we went by train up into the mountains. We were on the plains, and we went up into the mountains a little higher than here, about 6,000 feet, where they had tea plantations, but it wasn't any old train. We went to this town called Kanur, and here, Kanur up in the hills, and here's, here's the engine of the train that I rode. It's a steam engine, and it's it climbs 5,000 feet in 18 miles. So it's a cog railway. It's one of these narrow gauge, smaller trains. Locals called it a toy train. And it had this thing in the middle where it ratchets it, sort of grabs it and helps it up the steep, steep embankments. It had a wonderful, whimsical name called the Blue Mountain Express. Hardly an express. Top, top limit, speed limit on this train, nine miles an hour. It took over three hours to go 18 miles, and here we are, coming into Kanur on that train in 1946. We'll just watch it for a moment as it comes in. These are some missionaries getting off the train with, you'll see them here in a second. This is like watching an old Cary Grant movie, for those of you who know who Cary Grant was. This is, this is it. 
So then Ruth and I, not Ruth, Luann, my, wife, my sister and I, went to school in this little town called Kanur, and uh, our mom got us ready to go to school, and here we go. There I am. Short pants, sweater vest, that's why I like sweater vests, I think. That's what you call a sun helmet or a topi, and an umbrella. I'm four years old going to school. Some of you say, you know, that old guy who comes and speaks a little quirky. Well, if you went to school in short pants, a sweater vest, sweater vest and a sun helmet and an umbrella, you'd be quirky too. That's just how that works. Today, the train has changed. It's a different kind of train. And you see it going across gorges here. You, you go across dozens of gorges getting up to that, that place we went to school. And when you get there, you see this. These are the gardens of Kanur. That's a metaphor in my mind for the first two chapters of Ephesus, a train trip up through those mountains. So imagine with me this, if you're on that train trip with Paul in the first two chapters, and I'm just revisiting him for just a moment. As you chug up those gradients, Paul is talking, and he tells the Ephesians who Jesus is, that he's king of the universe, he's creator of it all, the whole cosmos, the whole thing. He's redeemer, he's savior, He's the sacrifice for us. You come around the bend and Paul says, you are now in Christ. Your head and heart are relocated to a different space. You see the world in a different way. If he were an artist, Paul would be pa painting in bold strokes and bright colors. And, and then he comes over the ridge and he says, look, you're a different people. We come down in the valley. He says, you're not like that city where you live where they worship the goddess Artemis. It's dominated by lust and manipulation and political games and bigotry. No, no, no. You're, you're no longer slaves to your puny imagination, all the stuff you can. But God has given you a new mind. You're free to see what God has in mind for you. And you come up around another curve, and he says, look, you are more than your circumstances. You are light in a dark place. You are one in Christ. You are fellow citizens. You are heirs. You're in the will and you're part of the household of God. He ends chapter two by saying, you know, that temple up there essentially, Artemis, it's gonna crumble over time, this huge temple in Ephesus. But God is making out of you a different building out of living stones. You are fitted together and the foundation is Christ Jesus. So that train, because it was a steam train, would stop two or three times on the way up to Kanur, up to that town. and because it needed to take on water for the engine. And so we'd get off and you'd step out and you'd look across a panorama of just, a, just the mountains and the gorges and the trees. Sometimes there were animals. On occasion, there'd be an elephant on the train tracks. Very cool if you're five years old. Just want to say that. And, and so here, Paul steps off the train, takes a deep breath as he takes all of this in and says, essentially, he says, okay, I've told you all about who the Christ is in your life, let me tell you who he is in mine. So chapter three is about Paul talking about who he is and why he has done this, walked across Turkey all those years and spoken the good news. So point one, if you're taking uh, notes or if you have the app is this. Paul models this mysterious plan because it's, he's talking about God's plan, the big picture. This is the big picture. Paul models this mysterious plan. Uh, we heard about it last week from Mackenzie, but the, the essence of the plan is this isn't just about Jewish people. This is for everybody. Christ came for everybody, and Paul's mission is to reveal that. In one sentence, Paul puts it out there. Listen to how he says it. This is chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason... He's talked about building the house and all that. I, Paul, the prisoner, not a prisoner, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. In other places, other letters, he calls himself an apostle, an apostle, an ambassador. Here, he's a prisoner, and I say, why is he saying that? Why is he saying he's a prisoner? Well, let's, let's just back up for a moment. I love maps. I love geography, so I'm going to flip a map up there, as you can see. There are four points on the map. The one down on the bottom points to Jerusalem. The second one is to Damascus in Syria. Third one is Tarsus. That's where Paul was born and brought up. And the fourth one over there on the, on the left is Ephesus. 
Paul was born about the same time Jesus was, according to scholars. And so at this point in writing, he's about 62 years old. He was brought up in, in Tarsus, that port city, which is very much like Ephesus. It's, it's got Roman soldiers on the streets. It's got Greek philosophers on the street corner. They're a Roman capital, but they speak Greek. It, it, and you've got mystery religions. You've got all kinds of stuff. Those of you who are city people, if you've ever been city people, you just get all this stuff going. And you throw into that a port city. You've got sailors on the street. So Tarsus was like that. And Ephesus was like that on steroids. Okay, And so he's brought up in this port city. He's a conservative Jew in a Roman city. He's speaking the Greek language. They worship the goddess Venus, the goddess of love. But he's educated as a Jewish boy. As a teenager, he goes to Jerusalem and is educated by a, 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 a very conservative, renowned scholar of the day called Gamaliel. Then we think he goes back to Tarsus, then comes back to Jerusalem in his early 30s. And when he comes back in his early 30s, he gets involved in a movement, movement that aims at eradicating people like you and like me. People who have decided that Jesus is the person to follow or people who are grappling with, was he really the son of God? And if so, is he Messiah? And so Paul in his early 30s is on a cleansing mission. Going up that coast, he's on a cleansing mission. It's not ethnic cleansing. He's not wiping out a group of people because of their ethnicity. It's religious cleansing. It's not just that they talked wrong, it's that in his mind they believed wrong about who God was. They thought this Jesus, who claims to be the Son of God, is the Messiah. They believe that. We need to take those people out. It's the ultimate cancel culture, okay? I'm not just canceling what you say and say you can't come to this meeting. I'm canceling you, okay? So his one goal was to take prisoners. That was his mission. I'll either take him to jail or I'll take him to jail and then kill him. That's who, what we call the Apostle Paul was. We would call him today just this radical person who would be a terrorist by our standards. So he's on his way to Damascus to capture some people. He's got letters from the authorities. And on the way there, a few miles outside Damascus, he gets captured. There's no biblical evidence that Paul ever knew Jesus in the flesh. They first meet on the Damascus Road when Jesus the Christ shows up and he knocks him down with light brighter than the noonday sun. If you've ever been near a lightning strike, you know you can get knocked down by easily. I mean, all of your, all of your ref reflexes just do this if it's close. It says light brighter than the noonday sun, knocks him down, and he goes blind for three days. 72 hours on the road to Damascus changes everything for the person we call the Apostle Paul. So he's now in Damascus. He's blind. He's praying, actually. That's what it says in Acts in the ninth chapter. You can read this in Acts 9. And God speaks to Ananias, who's a believer there in Damascus, and says, go to Saul. This is how it reads. Acts 9, 15, and 16. But the Lord said to Ananias, because Ananias had heard about him, Paul, and he says, this guy's killing us. Why, do I, why should I go to help him? He says, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias went and prayed, and Scripture says that scales fell off of Paul's eyes, Saul's eyes. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God. He grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. What a turnaround. What could we compare to this today? You say, well, if somebody politically was extreme left and they shifted and went extreme right, that'd be a comparison, not even close. Well, maybe if somebody didn't have any money, like the Cinderella story, working in a kitchen for some witchy woman, you know, maybe, maybe that would be it. And then the prince comes along and gives her the slipper. And then, well, that's closer. How about this? This is closest. I once was blind, but now I see. There's something about that, being able to see. 23 years ago, I was speaking in a congregation in Chicago for several weekends, and, and an ophthalmologist came to me. I had 
ever since I was seven, I had thick glasses, like Coke bottles, you know, Coke bottle bottoms. And, and um, he said, have you ever thought about LASIK surgery? This is back in the day, of course. I said, well, I, you know, he said, I'd, I'd like to give you that as a gift. I said, really? So I go into his office, 30 minutes later, I walk out, and you know, I couldn't, if I didn't have my glasses, I couldn't be doing this, right? And I walk out of his office and I can read license plates across the parking lot. <laughs> and for months afterwards, I'd say, Ruth, as we're driving along, you wanna know what gas prices are in the next block? It was, I once was blind and now I see, but that's nothing compared to this, what happened here. So when I, when I think about that, when I think about that change, that moment, was the springboard for the rest of Paul's life. Jesus was a rural person. He stayed close to home, probably never went more than 90 miles except when he was a baby and they had to run to Egypt for a while. Saul, on the other hand, Paul, probably walked 10,000 miles in his lifetime telling the Jesus story, sharing the Jesus message. You know how we are. We, we never forget moments when life shows up. We never forget those moments when things happen that change everything. Back when Ruth and I were young pastors at the University of Illinois, for 10 years, every Christmas and Easter, we would take university students to Guaymas, Mexico. It's about 2,000 miles by bus but <laughs> to Guaymas, Mexico from Urbana, Illinois. And so we would swap out drivers. We bought an old Greyhound bus. It was silver, and we named it, we named it Pescado de Plata, which means silver fish. And we would drive straight through, through the night, stop for gas, a little food, keep going. And we went to work in a place where there was this gentle young pastor by the name of Joel Quinones. And Joel Quinones was the kindest, gentlest person, but his story was this. He was brought up in Tijuana and he went to LA and when he was 19, he had done a bunch of stuff and he was charged with 27 counts of everything from armed robbery to kidnapping. And they put him in the California prison system at age 19, never to get out. He at one point was in the, in the facility they used for the criminally insane because he was so wacko. And 11 years in, they took him to the border, threw him out of the country, said, if you ever come back, we'll put you in prison, throw away the key. He had a praying mother who would try to visit him and his comment was, if your Jesus is so great, why doesn't he get, out, get me out of here, San Quentin? And uh, he wandered drunk, I think, into a little Mexican church on the border. And he said, you know, all of my life, people came to me and said, you follow this Jesus. And I said, these are crazy people. But he wandered in that night and Jesus did that. Years later, he came to Urbana to speak. And now he's a middle-aged guy. And he comes and he said, you know, Dick, I was on a television pro program recently in Tijuana and it was called, I Challenge You. And it was talk about your, the premises of your life. And I went in and sat down and there was a psychiatrist and a businessman there. And um, immediately, straight out of the box, he said, you talk about the love of God, but I need something. The businessman said, I need something that's concrete. It's just words. And he said, you don't know who I am, do you? He said, I escaped from a prison here in Tijuana years ago, two blocks down the road here. I escaped from prison. They called me El Changa the Ape. He said, I was a terrible person. I hurt people. I did bad things. And then some of these crazy people came to me and said, I just, wanna, I just wanna tell you about Jesus. And I said, I've tried everything else. Why not try this? And when I tried him, it changed everything. He said, mister, you wanna know, you wanna touch the love of God? Here, touch me. There's something about being radically changed. For some of us, it's little steps. Like I'm a seven-year-old in that school in Kanur, And I tell people when I was seven years old, I gave as much as I understood of me to as much as I understood of Jesus. And so my story is not dramatic like Paul's or like Joel Quinones's, but it, what happens is you have a totally different reality and view of life. So here's Paul in a prison and he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, because he met him as the Christ first, for the sake of you, Gentiles, anybody who's non-Jewish, he says, that's, that's who I am. You know, it looks like he's a prisoner of the Romans. That's what it looks like. He's chained to these guys. He's chained to the wall, whatever it is. And he says, no, 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 no. I have a different view of this. I'm not chained to these guys. I was captured by Jesus all those years ago. I'm a prisoner of his. I'm a voluntary prisoner of the most high God. And this is just a moment. This will go away. 
I mean, can you imagine being a guard chained to the Apostle Paul for eight hours at a shot? And they're going to the head guy and saying, please, don't make us go down there. He talks about Jesus all the time. Sometimes he even sings in the middle of the night. Let the, please don't do that. Anyway, here is this Saul, Paul, who is this radically changed person. So what looks like he's a prisoner of the Roman is not. I have a friend in North Carolina who used to have this saying. I'll put it on the screen. His saying was, what's happening is not what's going on. What's happening is not what's going on. And when you look at a changed life in Paul, in Saul, Saul, by the way, is his J Jewish name, Hebrew name. Paul is the Latin name, same name. So in one sentence that captures a world of meaning, Paul says it all. I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles. You say, you already said that twice. I'm going to say it two or three more times. Because one sentence can change anything. I, I mean, one sentence can be embedded in our psyche like Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg, four score and seven years ago, brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Martin Luther King on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, I have a dream. Those things are embedded in our minds. And for, for people who are believers to hear Paul say this, to hear him say, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, says it all. It tells us his identity. It tells us from where or from whom he gets his authority. And it tells us his destiny. He essentially is saying, I've been captured by the king of the universe, and I've been given grace and mercy, and if he can change me, a killer, he can change you. But to be in jail is hardly a good calling card. Somebody said, so um, what have you done most of your life? I said, well, I've made license plates. I've been in jail most of my life. I've been, you know, I just, you know, that's, that's hardly a credential that you want to put out there. But Paul makes it his credential. He says, I'm in prison for your sake. And it's okay. Because what, what these guys think they're doing isn't what's going on at all. What's happening is not what's going on. I am here for God's pur purpose. So he goes on to model God's way. And let me just run through this very quickly. You say, what, what is God's way? Well, if Jesus shows us anything, he shows us that humility and vulnerability, what the world systems count as weakness. Jesus says, that's what wins the day. Listen to how um, Paul says it in another letter. He says, God's power shows up in weakness. Paul's had a problem. We don't know what he calls a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that is. But he says, three times I asked Jesus to take it away. And this is what Jesus says back to him. This is in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. My grace is sufficient for you, for my, my power is made perfect in weakness. That's why for Christ's sake, I delight, Paul says, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I have a friend named Steve Moore who's a speechwriter for many years on Capitol Hill. He lives in Minnesota. This is what he says. I think I need to be really strong and smart and together and at the top of my game to serve Jesus. Wrong. I need to be broken, needy, and humble. You say, that doesn't make any sense. Precisely the point. God's way is not my way. God's way is not the world's way. Doesn't mean I have to be a doormat because I'm a doormat if I can't help myself. But when I volunteer, we heard about volunteers this morning, when I choose, it's a whole different thing. So Paul's mission is to explain the plan, point two in your notes. It's to explain the plan. I don't need to explain the plan because Pastor Mac did a great job last week talking about what the plan is. Essentially, the plan is he's here for all of us. And uh, as she so well put it last week, Paul is nothing if, if not repetitive. So he says that over and over again in the letter to the Ephesians. There is one part that's interesting beyond that. Uh, verse 8 of Ephesians 3 says, Though I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Then he goes on to say, His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. 
And I say, what's that about, rulers and authorities in heavenly realms? Well, Paul, in his Jewish context, had a view, an understanding that behind everything else out there, there's a battle between good and evil represented in, in scriptural cases between Satan and God himself. And these, these uh, forces are at work in some way. The forces of the enemy promote division. The forces of God promote together. Just to go back to the first of the book, Garden of Eden. Here is God who says to Adam and Eve, don't eat from that tree. You got all the other trees, don't eat from that one. Well, you know, when you tell me not to do that, I, as a kid, I got in trouble because they'd say, well, you know, don't climb that. I'd say, really, why? There must be a good reason for why not. And so I'd go for it, right? So I'm perfectly human, according to scripture, in that regard. But here, he says, don't do that. And the enemy comes along and says, really? Did God say that? He doesn't come straight out. He just comes in from the side. He said, did he say that? Because he's all about dissing. The enemy of your soul is about dissing. He is about disabling, disconnecting, disinheriting, disbelieving, disinforming. He's about creating distance. And God is about this, about bringing us together across lines and cultures and ethnicities and belief system, all of that. And the word that it's used here is manifold. Manifold, that I'm here to tell the manifold witness of God. Manifold is a word in the original that means a combination of colors. My wife, Ruth, is a gardener. And she'll look at a rose or a flower, and there are hundreds of varieties of these flowers. She says, isn't that cool how God puts those colors side by side? I would never put those colors side by side. And she looks at the sunset. She said, Dick, look at that. It's orange, and it's pink, and, it, and it's magenta, and it's blue. It's, it's, isn't that cool how all that comes together? And, and this is the character of what the church looks like. Some years ago, I had the privilege of preaching, speaking at Times Square Church in New York City, which is an old theater off Times Square. And uh, I looked down in the front row, and there are these hundreds of people. Of course, it's New York. They've got all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of people. But I looked down in the front row, and there's a bag lady, a very poor lady, sitting next to a Park Avenue matron, got furs on. And I'm saying, how does that happen? That happens when Jesus walks in and says, there's no difference between you at the core. I know you look different on the outside. I know you've had different benefits and all that sort of thing. So this... The speaking to the powers out there is this. Here's the message. When we're together, because he's talking about who are we as a church. Church meaning the people of God, the kingdom of God. This is what happens when we're together. We send a message to whatever powers are at work, saying the territory you're so used to ruling, with lives ruined and dreams smashed, that territory is being taken back one person at a time when we are a loving community, when we care for people. When, so that's the battle plan. You say, how do we do that? Well, here's the battle plan. It's not about fighting other people or other groups of people. It's about fighting the powers. You've got to make sure you've got the right battle going. It's not this one. It's this one out here. And it's about building a people who have new eyes. It's about people who, for whom the scales have fallen off. And they're seeing the world that natural eyes can't see. It's a radical thing. You say, well, how do we take action? How, we, how do we do things in a different way? Well, let me just toss out a couple of things. You know, you know how we tend to work in categories? Well, you know how old bald guys are. Or, you know, men. They got the emotions of a brick. Or, you know, whatever. Well, those people in that county, you know, that I have a friend... <laughs> I have a friend who pastors up in Summit County. He says, we live in the highest county in the country, both geographically and pharmaceutically. That's what, just what he said. So, but categories are a challenge. When you get hardening of the categories, you don't help people, you fence yourself in. Well, I know how those people are. You don't know how those people are. I don't know how those people are. What if we spent a week not trying not to use categories. What if we did that? How about labels? We give labels to people, labels to groups. What, what if we didn't do that? Years ago, I was speaking at a military retreat in Germany, and the chaplain who was in charge had us do small groups. And he just said, um, 
as one of the exercises, I want you to take this jacket. And he took his jacket off. I want you to take this jacket, and I'm going to pass it around, probably six, eight people in a group, and I want you to do with this jacket what you would like God to do with you. And some people, somebody threw it down and stomped on it. Somebody else sort of did this to it. Several people did this. When it came back to the chaplain, he reached in, grabbed the label on his jacket, and ripped it out. I'd like to work in a place and with people in a way where we didn't label them, that we let the label be the one that God gives them. And so, what about, what about this? And I'll hurry on here. Almost done. What about all the time I spend defending myself? What if I was unoffendable? How about that? That's hard because, you know, you can offend me in several places, you know. <laughs> Years ago when I was first here, I was at, at the Timberline Road Church. I was walking down and a 50-ish fellow came up to me and he, he wanted to compliment me. I know he did. He said, I love it when you speak. He said, it's just really, it's really wonderful. He said, of course, you don't do much for my 20-year-old son. I said, thank you very much. You know, I, so that, that, but that, that idea, what would happen if we didn't spend all the time that we try to spend defending ourselves? So I, I think the church has a battle stance, okay? Well, what do you think it might be? Well, I don't think it's this. I don't, I don't think that's the battle stance of the church of Jesus Christ. I don't think it's, if we're Kung Fu or Taekwondo, I don't think it's that. How about this? How about that for a battle stance? Here's Jesus who is so right and so good. And I, I like him, but I can't stand being around him because it, I, don't, I, don't, I can never be like And so I take him and I throw him on the cross and I say, there, take that. That'll get rid of you. And he says, fine, folks. If that's how it's going to be, that's the way I'll love you. And he takes the worst thing I can do to him and he redeems me with it. I would submit to you this is the battle stance of the church of Jesus Christ. It is so different from culture. It is so different from the powers. And the question is, how do I feed that view? How do I get it right? Ephesians 3.12, it says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Freedom and confidence. Essentially, that literally, that language in the original means I can approach God with freedom of speech. Free speech. When have you heard that recently? I mean, we... We've heard forever about First Amendment rights for speaking. Here is Paul saying, forget the First Amendment rights. Why don't I give you great commandment rights? And you walk right into the throne room of the Most High God who could vaporize you by looking at you, and you can say anything you want to him. You say, what if I'm mad? Oh, I think he can handle your mad. What if I'm really ticked off and I've been hurt deeply? Oh, I think he can work with that. What if I want to cuss him? Oh, I think, you know, he's heard more words than you have. Well, what if I'm really here? What do you do with a God for whom you can walk into the throne room and say anything and ask anything? And when you ask him, he gives you wisdom. What you do is you rejoice in that. So having framed the battle, Paul prays. And now we're coming in for the landing. This is his pr- and his prayer is simply this, point four, is that we will get it that we, who are believers, will get what he has given us in Jesus Christ, all the range, all the freedom, all the sacrifice he made for us that we'll understand. And what a great prayer for these Ephesians. He spent three years in Ephesus. He knows these people, and he pours out his heart. Listen to how it reads. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, and I pray that out of his, his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, because you trusted him. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, and here he sounds like a contractor, to grasp how wide, how long, how high, And deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He's like a contractor measuring space in a room. 
And the, he, he's, the strongest word here is comprehend, fully grasp the love of God. That some, I mean, if I understood how much God loved me, if I understood how much he cared for me, that would naturally translate into how I treat people. It just would. Because if, if you knew all the stuff I'd done or all the things I'd thought, and here's the God who just in, invests himself, infects me with himself. You talk about a COVID infection. If, if he did that in a positive way in my life, it, he's saying this is beyond rational knowledge. This is sort of like blinding light on the road to Damascus, that God needs to reveal himself to you in this way. By the end of the passage, if Paul's pen could speak, it would be shouting. Because now he's saying, I want you to understand who you are. And he, he starts out by saying, now to him who is able. And what we're going to do is, it'll be on the screen. Why don't you say it out loud with me? These are the closing verses of Ephesians 3. And it's Paul's language, but it's our moment. Let's say it together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's try it one more time. A little more punch. Give me a little more punch. There. Here we go. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's like Paul is saying, for all of that, so there, so be it. The, the core of the text, beyond all measure, is translated in our language today. Awesome, takes your breath away. If you're Buzz Lightyear, it's to infinity and beyond, whatever. It's that kind, it's way past what we can imagine. So you're that church full of his glory, full of his compassion and love. That's his plan A, and there is no plan B. That's it. You're it. I'm it. And together, we speak not only to our culture, but to the powers, however that works. So here's my closing. Twice a year, my parents would come to that school. That little sequence you saw was the first few days of school, but it was a boarding school. So twice a year they would come from several hundred miles away and they'd send word up to where I lived in a little guy's thing. This was a girls' boarding school, but they let little boys go there till they were 10 and then they discovered those were girls and they shipped the boys someplace. I don't know what they did. But so I'm in this little place called the bird's nest and, and they would say, Dickie, your parents are here. And on those little short legs you saw, I'd go running, without my umbrella, I'd go running down the driveway and my dad and I had this game. I'd jump into his arms. He was 6'3", 240. And I jump into his arms, he'd hug me, and then he'd boost me up and grab my calves. So I'm standing up and he's holding onto my calves. And then he would lift me like that. If you're only three feet tall and your 6'3 dad holds you up like that, you're like 10 feet in the air, dude. You can, you can see forever when you're there. It's like st getting off the Blue Mountain Express and looking out over that panorama and you see things in a way you've never seen them before. That's how it is. And here is Paul saying, I want you to be a people that sees forever. We are the see forever people. We are his glorious church, redeemed, transformed, growing together. The mystery is everybody can have access. The power is expressed by profound embrace. And we do battle against unseen forces, not this way, but this way. That's how it is. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you came to us with arms wide open and we tried to run and we hid behind the door and piled the furniture up against it and you smash it down with your cross and you chase us across the living room and grab us in the kitchen and say, I got you. And we say, I give up. I will be a prisoner of the Most High God with joy. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. If there's anyone here today, Lord, whose heart has been touched by your word, let the stuff that's both just go on by. But may your word seek its way into the nooks and crannies of our hearts so that we can continue to grow in you to be that 
glorious church and a free people who walk with arms wide open in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Would you all stand with us as we sing and praise our God who gives us our identity and our purpose and our salvation.
may be here this morning, and perhaps you could have the lights up just a little bit so I can see the whites of these friends' eyes. I love seeing the whites of the eyes. The, um, you may be here this morning and say, you know, I sort of get what you were talking about. I don't fully understand, but something in me is drawing me to it. Well, that's not because you're great or Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority. 